Welcome, everyone. I'm Kathy O'Regan, Assistant Secretary for the Office of Policy Development and Research here at HUD. We are very happy to be here today with you to present the methodology and findings of the Housing Choice Voucher Program Administrative Fee Study. We'll call it the Admin Fee Study for the rest of our conversation. The purpose of this gathering is to present the study in an interactive setting, including through the large webcast. I know we had more than 400 uh, people actually sign on for this. So you'd have a chance to get questions answered. This isn't a presentation of any new HUD policy, but rather we want to take the opportunity to focus on the study and answer some questions. So let me start with the importance of the study. This is the first study in over 30 years to rigorous, rigorously determine how much time it takes to administer the Housing Choice Voucher Program and to provide us with the actual costs of running a high-performing and efficient program. Since the beginning of the voucher program in the mid-1970s, the formula for allocating administrative fees has largely relied on the differences in fair market rents, or FMRs, for determining administrative fee allocations. This allocation was based on the weak theory that FMRs correlate with wage rates and other costs of operation. This theory, however, was just that, a theory. It was not based on knowledge of the actual cost of running the voucher program. The lack of data on actual cost has been a serious impediment for HUD in making the case for adequate administrative funding of this program and for demonstrating that we are allocating the funding we do receive appropriately. The admin fee study provides exactly this information. The value of this study is very much driven from its methodology, so we're going to spend a bunch of time today uh, going through the details of the methodology. But I want to highlight a few key points first um, at a high level. Perhaps the most important point is that this study went inside actual program operations by collecting real data on the time it takes PHA staff to conduct all the various activities needed to administer the, pro the voucher program, from conducting intake, income recertification, through unit inspections and managing wait lists, all of that. Linking these time data with information on agency expenditures enabled the researchers to translate the time spent on program activities into overall program costs to identify actual cost drivers and ultimately to develop an administrative fee formula based on the cost drivers. The robust data collected demonstrate what it truly costs to administer a well-run voucher program and identified an allocation formula that reflects those costs. So now, before I move on to uh, introducing Lourdes, I want to take a few minutes to give thanks and we have a lot of thanks to give for this study. It was a massive effort, um, not specifically, not just for those on the research team, but primarily for those of you in the field um, who helped us and those of us and those of you who participated in the expert panel. Uh, uh, I want to start first with the 60 PHAs and their 909 staff that participated in the random moment sampling, responding to more than 580,000 <laughs> notifications during the course of their work days. When I read that number, I just, um, we can't thank you enough. I can't imagine, your jobs are hard enough. This was, we did this study during a time of sequestration, so it was a hard job under a particularly low level of funding, and we interrupted you apparently continuously as you were doing your work. So we have to start by uh, saying that the study would not have been possible without those 60 PHAs and their participating staff nor without the 130 PHAs that participated in the small PHA survey that we needed to supplement the information. So thank you all. Would also like to thank the PHA executive directors and voucher program directors and industry leaders who served on the expert industry technical review group about whom you'll hear more during the study. This group met five times over the last five years, closely reviewing and providing detailed comments on a number of critical draft deliverables. The individuals who served demonstrated a commitment to this group and this study that is truly admirable. Because of their input, the research team and the department made changes to the study's sample size, which was critical, data analysis, and data presentation in the draft final report. 
And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Lourdes Castro Ramirez, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Public and Indian Housing, to share her remarks on this important study. Thank you, Lourdes. Thank you so much, Kathy, and many thanks to the policy development and research team for your work and dedication to this study. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this public briefing. I'm uh, Lourdes Castro Ramirez, and I have uh, the distinct responsibility and honor uh, to lead the Office of Public and Indian Housing. I would also, as Kathy mentioned, I would also like to extend uh, our appreciation to all the public housing agencies and to all the members of the expert and industry technical review group, uh, because I know that uh, this was uh, a long commitment, um, as Kathy mentioned, you know, this uh, work um, and effort uh, took place over about a five-year period, uh, and so we appreciate your participation and the input uh, that was gathered uh, in this effort. Having spent the last 16 years working at the local level with two housing authorities, and also having had the uh, privilege of running one of the largest housing choice voucher programs in Los Angeles, I know firsthand uh, how um, the impact of both sequestration and uh, reduction in admin fees has impacted public housing agencies both in terms of delivering their mission, but more importantly, how it's impacted the families that they're trying to serve. To cope with the reductions in admin fee, many housing agencies had to take drastic measures, including freezing staff, reducing staffing levels, and in many cases, uh, this has led to a decrease in the number of families served. So this study will help to support the department's request for full funding, knowing that we now have information, documented information, on the actual cost to run an effective and efficient housing choice voucher program. A program that is administered by 2,400 public housing agencies across the country, serving about 2.2 million households. Now that we've completed the study, um, I welcome and encourage uh, open dialogue, your feedback, uh, because we eventually want to get to a point where the, the study and the study findings can lead to a, a, a better, more robust uh, formula. I also want to share with you that we have brief OMB and appropriation staff along with authorizing staff about the study and the study findings, and we are committed to continuing those briefings. Uh, the, the first briefing went very well, and so as we move into this next phase of legislative proposals, we continue, you know, we're committed to continuing to uh, keep uh, them informed. Now it's my distinct um, honor to introduce um, the project director for the study, uh, Jennifer Turnham from Apton Associates. Please, I encourage you to um, ask questions, um, to be engaged, and to continue in this uh, dialogue with us uh, throughout this process. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you all for coming and for those of you who are standing by on the phone. Hopefully the everything is, is great for those on the phone. Um, my name is Jennifer Turnham. I'm from Apt Associates, which is the research and consulting firm that uh, hired to conduct the Housing Choice Voucher Administrative Fee Study. <clears throat> and I was the project manager for the study. So before getting into the findings, I also want to acknowledge all the hard work of the study team, our partners at HUD, the Expert and Industry Technical Review Group, and the nearly 200 housing authorities that participated in different ways um, in different aspects of the study. So I to thank you all for your help for that. Um, I also want to just lay out one ground rule, which is that we have a lot of information to present. So we've uh, elected to hold the questions until the Q&A session at the end. OK, 
So I'd like to start by presenting an overview of the key study findings, many of which we'll get into as the presentation goes on. One of the key findings is that the PHAs have been significantly underfunded to run the Housing Choice Voucher Program. And this finding comes out of careful measurement of the actual cost of operating the program at 60 high-performing PHAs across the country. Across the 60 PHAs, the average cost of administering the program in 2013, which is our study period, was approximately $70 per voucher per month. And based on the costs estimated by the study, and then we did analysis of the factors that affect those costs, um, the study then goes on to propose a new formula with seven variables or formula inputs that cover a broad range of cost drivers capturing the actual costs of running a high-performing and efficient HCV program. The study report also compares the fees that would be received under the proposed formula to those that were actually received under the existing formula between July 2013 and June 2014. So this period was chosen because it was the latest data that were available at the time that we did our analysis for the study. So for this time period, the study found that 92% of housing authorities would have higher fees under the proposed formula compared to the receive fees that they actually received during this period under the existing formula. So why was the study undertaken? Um, as, as was mentioned during the introductory remarks, since the beginning of the program in the mid-70s, the formula for allocating administrative fees has largely relied on differences in fair market rents, with agencies in areas with higher fair market rents getting a higher fee per voucher, and agencies in areas with lower fair market rents getting a lower fee. And the formula was based on the theory that FMRs correlate with local wage rates and other costs of operation, but wasn't based on the actual costs of running the program. So there's a need to document the actual costs of administering the program to support the budget needs um, for optimal program administration. And in recent years, as you know, funding for the administrative fee has been less than 80% of the current fee formula and as low as 69% during sequestration. So the study seeks to document the actual costs of administering the program by answering four main research questions. What accounts for the variation in administrative costs across PHAs? How much does it cost to run a high-performing and efficient program? What would be an appropriate formula for allocating fees? And is there a minimum size below which an HCV program cannot successfully operate on administrative fees alone? So how did we do the study? We used a rigorous multi-method approach and that was designed to obtain the highest quality data with the resources and time available. So we took a very careful approach to selecting the study sites, measuring time and costs, analyzing the cost drivers, and then developing and testing a proposed formula. We conducted, we used site visits and uh, CMAP data to identify the 60 high performing and efficient agencies um, for the main study. We also recorded time spent on the program using smartphones and random moment sampling, which we'll talk about. We then linked the time data to labor and non labor and overhead costs so that we could calculate ov overall program costs for each of the 60 agencies in the study. Then once we had a cost for each of the 60 agencies, we conducted regression analysis on those costs to understand what are the factors that explain the differences in costs, what are the cost drivers for the program. And then we use those cost drivers to develop a proposed administrative fee formula. We only had a few PHAs with fewer than 250 vouchers under lease in the study sample and we didn't have any PHAs in the main sample with less than 100 vouchers, so we conducted telephone interviews with 130 small agencies to understand their costs. As was mentioned, the study was not done in a vacuum. Um, HUD and the research team engaged a large and active expert and tech industry technical review group, and that included represent rent representatives from the major affordable housing groups, uh, executive directors and HCV program directors, 
affordable housing technical assistance providers, researchers, and industrial engineers. And as was mentioned, this group reviewed the study design and results in many separate stages in the study and really provided invaluable feedback. We are extremely grateful as the research team to have had this resource available to us because it really made a lot of improvements to the study. We made changes to the study sample size, the data analysis, um, virtually all aspects of the study and the presentation uh, of the results based on the input. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how the 60 main study sites were selected. They were selected using a three-step process. So we began by drawing a random sample of CMAP high performers stratified by program size. We wanted to make sure we had a distribution of agencies of different program sizes. And the sampling universe for that random sample were PHAs that received high performer ratings on CMAP in either three of the past four years or if they were only rated, if they weren't rated every year, then two of the last four years. We also added to the sampling frame PHAs recommended by HUD headquarters and field staff that may not have met the CMAP criteria. So that was the universe for drawing a sample. From that, we drew a random sample stratified by size. And what, with that random sample, HUD headquarters and field staff reviewed the list for no, any known compliance issues or open findings that wouldn't have come out um, through the CMAP scores. Then after that point, we, can, we, we uh, invited PHAs to participate in the study, and among those that were willing to participate, we conducted site visits to confirm high performance and efficiency. So these site visits were typically um, one to three day visits that involved a lot of interviewing of staff and also file review. So the result um, from this essentially random sampling approach is that we have a group of 60 PHAs that are very diverse, a very diverse sample of high performing and efficient housing authorities. They range in size from just over 100 vouchers to more than 45,000 vouchers. We are, the study was located in 29 states and all of the regions of the continental US. Um, they're in urban, suburban, rural markets with a range of fair market rents. So for example, the 2014 two-bedroom two fair market rent for the study sites ranged from a low of about 600 to a high of about $1,600 per month, which gives a sense of the different markets um, that the study was in. About 40% uh, of the study was, was PHAs that only run the HCV program. They may run other programs as well, but they don't run public housing. And then 60% were PHAs that have a mix of HCV and public housing. And there are a mix of agency types. So the majority of agencies in the sample are standalone PHAs, but we also have units of government and nonprofit organizations, and three of the PHAs are statewide PHAs. Okay. So I mentioned, we've mentioned random moment sampling a couple of times, and I know this is a new concept, a new term, and it's, it can be confusing. So what is random moment sampling? That is the study's method of measuring the time that staff spent on the Housing Choice Voucher program. It's a way of developing a highly accurate picture of HCV work that allows us to capture a lot of detail on all the different activities that, uh, that might go into the program. So RMS uses a, it's a device, it's a smartphone essentially, a specially programmed smartphone to collect information on what staff are working on. Each staff in the study, and there were more than 900 of them, are assigned a smartphone and they receive 12 to 15 notifications per day at random for a period of 40 days or about two months. When they get a notification, they indicate what they're working on at that time by clicking through a series of touch screens. You know, which program am I working on? What program area? What activity? And in some cases, what household type does this relate to? So what happens over the 40 days, the responses from an individual staff provide a very detailed picture of that staff's workload, um, including how much time they spend on the HCV program overall, which is very important because not every agency has dedicated 100, staff that are 100% dedicated to the HCV program. But then within that, you know, how much time they spend on the different HCV activities. 
So before settling on RMS, um, we, the study team beta tested three different time measurement approaches. Direct observation, this is your sort of traditional time in motion where somebody's the clipboard watching staff. We tested timesheets, which I'm sure a number of you are familiar with, and then RMS. And we found RMS to be the most efficient and effective method, um, getting us the most detail, the most accurate information, and the least burdensome for staff, believe it or not, even, even with the 12 to 15 notifications. Um, and then the study team then pre-tested the RMS data collection method again at four housing authorities to make sure that it was feasible. And we made a number of adjustments in terms of the functionality of the phone, including adding a text function that they could text the study team and things like that based on those pre-tests. But again, we found it to be an accurate and effective way of collecting the data. So overall, how did the time measurement work? It was uh, very, very successful. You know thanks to all the staff that, that put in their hard work on this. Um, we conducted, as I mentioned, it happened over an eight week period at each PHA, and we did that in cohorts of six to eight PHAs approximately between January 2013 and April 2014. So that we're going year round in cohorts of PHAs. We collected more than 580,000 notifications um, from more than 900 staff. And Again, we achieved a 99% response rate, which meant that 99.1% of those notifications were responded to with a median response time of 18 minutes. And again, I want to emphasize the high response rate and the low median response time is really a testament to how seriously the PHA staff took the study and what a great job they did under very difficult uh, situ circumstances. Okay, so what did we find in terms of how much time is spent on the program? What we found from the time measurement study is that housing authorities spend on average 13.8 hours per voucher per year on frontline HCV work. This includes 6.8 hours on ongoing occupancy work, so that's the biggest share of the work, and this is work for existing HCV households. And most of the work on ongoing occupancy is for annual recertifications and interim recertifications. In addition, um, staff spend about 2.3 hours per voucher per year on intake and lease-up activities for new households, similar amount of time on inspections for both new and existing households, again, a similar amount of time on all the program monitoring and supervisory work that goes into the program, and then a small amount of time on supportive services outside of the FSS program. So we did have a number of PHAs in the study that had HCV FSS programs as well, family self-sufficiency program, and we studied the family self-sufficiency program separately. So that is a chapter of the, of the draft final report, but it's not, uh, we're not covering that today. We found that staff, uh, that the agencies spend extra time on new allocations of project-based and VASH vouchers. But the number of PHAs receiving these new allocations and administering the vouchers was very small out of our, out of our 60 PHAs, which resulted in inconclusive data. We had uh, wide confidence intervals around the time, time estimates for these vouchers, and so we recommended in the study that, that HUD further uh, study these, these special voucher programs. So what accounts for the variation in administrative costs across PHAs? We analyzed a large number of PHA characteristics, program characteristics, and market characteristics that could potentially be cost drivers. We, this was one of the areas where the expert in industry technical review group was extremely helpful in helping us solicit ideas for what, wanted to make sure we cast a broad net for what could possibly affect HCV administrative costs. And in the end, we tested more than 50 potential cost drivers. We began by running some basic correlation analyses to identify whether any of these factors were indeed related to the variation in per unit costs that we observed across our 60 study sites. And then we tried them one by one in a, in a base model and then in more sophisticated models um, with, again, with careful consideration to the theory behind each of these. Uh, and then we ended up to, that's how we derived the seven cost drivers included in the administrative fee formula. And the, the report, if anyone gets there, has a lot of discussion of sort of that process of winnowing down from the 50 potential to the seven um, final cost drivers. Initially, uh, and from the beginning, we found that program size, so the number of vouchers under lease, 
as well as the prevailing local wage rate were highly correlated with per unit costs. And those two factors alone explained about 35% of the variation that we found in costs. And then the other five cost drivers in the formula explained about another 30% of the variation. So we're able to explain about 65% of the observed variation in the cost across our study sites, which means that about 35% of the variation is not explained by any of the variables that we were able to identify in the study. So what are the components of the administrative fee formula? What did we come out with after uh, all of this testing? We came out with seven variables. And I'm going to try to spend a fair amount of time, and this is a lot of information to take in. The first variable, which we're calling program size, recognizes the, the, our finding that smaller PHAs have higher per unit costs than larger PHAs, so that there are some economies of scale in the program. And the way that translates in the formula is that PHAs would receive a higher amount per voucher if they have fewer than 750 vouchers under lease. The second variable we're calling wage index um, comes out of the, uh, the BLS quarterly census of employment and wages, which provides wage data on local government workers throughout the country. So what this variable is, is that for each PHA, they're either located in a metro area or a non-metro area. And what it does is it calculates the ratio of the average metro or non-metro wage rate for local government workers in that state compared to the national average. So a ratio that's, that's higher than one, it, they have a higher wages in general than the rest of the country. Lower than one, their wages are uh, lower than the rest of the country. And this just reflects the, the diversity of markets out there and, and, and pay scales. We also have a health insurance cost index, which is somewhat similar, but captures some of the variation in benefits costs that PHAs uh, would have to pay. So here we have a data from the uh, Department of Health and Human Services that provides information on the average uh, cost of health insurance to employers in each state. So for each PHA, they, there's an average uh, health insurance cost to employers in their state divided by the national average to come out with this uh, index or ratio. So that captures benefits differences. Then we have um, the rest of the variables in the study come out of um, HUD PIC data. So the first is the percent of households with earned income, which is the percent of a PHA's voucher households that have income from wages. So this is one of the items that's reported through the 5-8, and we have data on that. Um, the new admissions rate is, the, um, is another variable, and this is the number of households admitted to the program, and this could be as a result of turnover or new allocations of vouchers as a percent of the PHA's vouchers under lease. So this is an indication of how much new intake and new lease up work an agency has to do. The small area rent ratio may be the hardest one um, to understand, so I'm take it. it's, it's a measure of how the average rents in the neighborhoods where a PHA's voucher participants live compare to the average rents for the overall area. So if you have a higher small area rent ratio, it means that more of your voucher households are living in relatively high rent neighborhoods compared to the broader area. And then the final um, variable is what we're calling 60 miles, which is a little easier to understand. It's simply the percent of voucher holders that are living more than 60 miles from the PHA's headquarters. So this is an indication of how, how far they might have to drive for inspections, whether an agency might need to set up satellite offices. Um, anything that needs to be done in person could, could be more expensive if people are located uh, further away. So as I mentioned, this, this set of seven variables that are in our proposed formula explain about 65% of the variation in agency costs that we saw across our 60 agencies. And given the complexity of the HCV program um, and the great diversity of PHAs out there across the country, this is a very high predictive value. 
As a point of comparison, we ran the current administrative fee formula against our 60 uh, study sites, and it only explained, the current formula only explained 33% of the variation in per unit costs. So the seven variables cover a broad range of cost drivers. Um, kind of reiterating what I just talked about, we're recognizing that smaller PHAs have higher per unit administrative costs. And we're recognizing that costs vary locally based on differences in the prevailing wage rate and based on the local cost to employers of providing um, benefits and primarily health insurance. The formula also respect, reflects aspects of the program that will take more time, um, admitting new households to the program, serving households with earned income, assisting households to lease up in relatively high cost areas, and administering the program over a larger geographic area. So those are the, the factors that this set of variables um, uh, reflects and explains. So now how much does it cost to administer the program? Um, the, the study you know, answers this question. It really provides the first research-based data on the cost of running a high-performing and efficient program. And this is the first research-based information since the late 80s. And prior studies had focused on large urban PHAs as opposed to a broad sample of, of PHA sizes and market types. And only one study, which was in the late 80s, had measured cost directly. So this study you know, has a, <clears throat> excuse me, a rigorous methodology, a range of PHA sizes and locations, the input from our large group of expert and technical reviewers, and its attempt in, and direct time measurement has attempted to correct for the shortfalls of previous studies. So the headline of what we show is that PHAs are significantly underfunded to run the program. The average cost of administering the program in 2013 was about $70 per voucher per month, and the lowest cost was about $42 per voucher per month. As a point of comparison, the average fee received um, during this period was about $52 per voucher per month, and the lowest fee was about $30 per voucher per month. So this was a period where the average proration over this uh, kind of two halves of a year was 70, about 75%. So only two of the 60 PHAs in the study sample received enough fee during this period to cover their costs. So in other words, the fees received in this period did not cover the costs incurred for 58 of the 60 study PHAs. So now we turn to the implications of the proposed formula for program costs. The estimated cost of the new formula is $1.84 billion for the July 2013 through June 2014 period. So that's already a little bit in the past. And at that time, this is about 95% of what it would have cost to fully fund the program under the current formula at that time. In order to make sure that fees keep pace with inflation and reflect current program characteristics, the fees in the formula would be updated each year based on the formula variables, so new information coming through the PIC data and the, all the formula variables, and also an inflation factor that would capture, we, we propose a blended factor that, that captures inflation in wages, benefits, and non-labor costs. So an important aspect is how the formula handles portability. The study found that agencies with a higher number of port-ins had higher than average costs, supporting the theory that there is additional time associated with processing port-ins and with working with issuing PHAs. So the, the new formula recognizes the costs borne by both the issuing and the receiving PHAs, and it removes uh, the sort of administrative fee cost-based disincentives for porting and decreases administrative burden for PHAs. So the proposed formula would remove inter-PHA billing for administrative costs associated with portability. So PHAs under the new formula receive 100% of their fee for their, their own vouchers that they administer in their area and also for port-in vouchers that they administer on behalf of other PHAs. And then the issuing PHAs, or they, those PHAs receive a supplemental 20% of their own admin fee for any port out vouchers that
that are administered by other PHAs. And that 20% is to cover the billing associated work around the billing around the HAP. Um, because that would continue. So PHAs would not bill for the administrative um, fees anymore, but they would continue to work with each other to bill for the, the HAP. <clears throat> so th basically the new administrative fee formula would embed portability related fees for receiving and issuing PHAs into the count of vouchers under lease. So again, a PHA would receive fee based on its vouchers under lease, which would include port in vouchers and then would, in, would receive a supplemental fee for any port out vouchers that are administered by other PHAs. So the study found among the 60 PHAs, as I've mentioned, that per unit costs ranged from about 40, a low of about $42 to a high of $109 per unit month leased, with an average of $70 and a median of around $65. The PHA with the lowest cost in our study, the $42, um, had below average values for four of the formula variables. So it, it makes sense that, that it would have a lower cost. But that is the lowest cost that we observed among any high performing and efficient program. And what we, uh, in developing the formula, a straight application of the formula would result in fees for a small number of PHAs that fall below that lowest observed cost of $42. And because we didn't observe any PHAs that were operating high performing and efficient programs for less than $42, and of course most PHAs in the study had costs much more than $42, <coughs> we recommended that the formula establish a floor of $42 for PHAs not in the U.S. territories. So this is for PHAs that would otherwise receive less than $42 just based on a straight application of the formula. Now the formula predicts much lower fees for PHAs located in the U.S. territories than the fees that they get under the current formula. And there's several reasons why PHAs in the territories uh, might be different. We didn't have any PHAs in the U.S. territories in the study. They didn't come out of the random sample, so we were not able to directly measure their costs. Whereas other PHAs were in a lot of states and all of the regions of the country. The data on healthcare costs that we use for the formula isn't available for the territories. So we have to use a, an, an average there. And the cost of providing housing may be very different. So for these reasons, the study recommends that the formula establish a different floor for PHAs located in the US territories. And we recommended a floor of $54 per unit month leased, which is based on a calculation related to the lowest fee uh, received among these PHAs during the study period. But it's important to note that most PHAs will have higher costs than the formula floors because they have higher values on the variables and the formula is designed to capture the cost for those PHAs. So it's only a small number that would be affected um, by the formula floor. Thank you. Quick drink here. So the study team conducted telephone interviews with 130 small PHAs to better understand the cost of operating a voucher program with fewer than 250 vouchers under lease. We did have small PHAs in the study sample, but there's a lot, a lot of them out there and we wanted to make sure we were really understanding um, their cost structure. What we found is that the small programs, there's an inverse pattern of cost per unit, which means that costs go down steadily with as the number of vouchers go up. So there are economies of scale. So PHAs with fewer than 50 vouchers under lease fared worse and had the highest estimated cost relative to fees. However, as with the main study sample, a majority of all the small programs, the 130, had costs that exceeded the fees they received. Just like in the main, you know, in the main study that was the case 58 out of 60 had costs that exceeded the fees that they received. We also didn't find, while we see a pattern of costs increasing as number of vouchers go down, we didn't find a clear breaking point, which is what we had potentially expected to find, but it wasn't there. So we, don't, we couldn't identify a specific number of vouchers below which operating on fees alone is not financially feasible. As I said, in most cases during this period, operating on, on fees alone was not financially feasible for most of the PHAs in the study.
So what is the impact of the recommended formula for PHAs? Again, the first point to make is that the study uh, found that the fees received for the July 2013 through June 2014 period under the existing formula only covered about 77% of the estimated cost for the average PHA. So comparing to the fees received in that period between July 2013 and July 2014, 92% of PHAs would have higher fees under the proposed formula compared to the existing formula, and 8% of PHAs would have lower fees. That 8% translates to about 181 PHAs, and among those 181 PHAs that would have lower fees, about a third or 65 PHAs would bear most of those losses, experiencing uh, a reduction in fee ranging from 10% to 37.4%. So this table looks at the impact of the recommended formula on PHAs by size category. And as you can see, a majority of the PHAs in all the size categories would experience a gain under the new formula relative to what they were getting during this time period. But in general, a higher percentage of the smaller PHAs would experience a gain uh, compared to larger PHAs. And this is, there's a couple reasons for this. The, mainly because the larger PHAs don't get the extra fee for being small, because they're not small. And they also tend to have higher FMRs, under the, so the, meaning that they get higher fees under the existing formula. Just leave that up there for just a minute. So this table presents uh, the same information on, by region. So uh, the Midwest, South, and parts of the Northeast all have a substantial number of PHAs that would increase, experience an increase in fees, the, the gainer PHAs, under the new formula. But the West and the U.S. territories have fewer PHAs that would experience an increase and more PHAs that would experience a decrease in the decliner column. Again, why would this be so? Well, PHAs in the West, on average, tend to be larger. And they also tend to have lower than average values for two of the formula variables, households with earnings and the new admission rate. So on the formula side, they tend to come out a little bit lower on those variables. And then on the comp comparison to the existing formula, they tend to have higher fees than PHAs in other parts of the country. So the two things uh, result in the West <coughs> having a, a larger share um, that would not experience a gain. And in the PHAs in the territories tend to have below average values on three formula variables, the wage index, households with earnings, and new admissions. And they have much higher than average fees under the existing formula. So now I will turn it over to Marina Myrie, who's our project lead from HUD for this study, um, to moderate a discussion with HUD staff about the study rollout and implementation. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to thank uh, Jennifer for presenting the study methodology and findings. Um, and I would like to introduce our panelists uh, who will discuss study rollout and implementation. So to my left is Todd Richardson, the Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy Development in the Office of Policy Development and Research. And to his left is Milan Ozdenek, Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Public Housing and Voucher Programs in the Office of Public and Indian Housing. And to his left is Danielle Basterash, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Policy Program and Legislative Initiatives in the Office of Public and Indian Housing. And Jennifer is here to join us for, for questions later. So I'll turn it over to Todd. Thank you, Marina. So my job here is to say, where do we go with taking this study from uh, an excellent research study to how it might be used for policy going forward. So we're implementing a uh, long-term rollout here to, uh, conv to, to be in as inclusive as possible and get as much feedback as we can on the study and on the proposed formula here. So we released the study on April 8th. Uh, 
in its executive, the executive summary has been released on the web. We've also released the draft report uh, that you can read the whole, the whole report there. And we have the PowerPoint presentation also online. All of this is on www.huduser.org. We're having today's briefing. Um, and uh, this is targeted at the PHA industry groups, the public housing agencies, HUD staff, other interested folks. It is going to be, uh, it's webcast and folks can watch it later as well, so we're taping this. Um, in, the in the next week, um, we're going to provide each PHA and provide a, a full list of how the uh, administrative fees that are proposed under this formula, the full cost of running a well-run Housing Choice Voucher program, uh, how that compares to how much agencies actually received in fees. So we're going to provide a list that compares these two things. And uh, this is where I'm going to digress, digress a little bit from my, uh, my prepared notes here a little bit and respond to a letter we received from the three agencies, Klafa, Nauru, and Fada, who have been really terrific partners with us on the EITRG. They've given us a lot of great feedback. And um, on April 13th, they sent us a letter with some additional really helpful feedback on the study and how we roll out the study and what information we provide to individual housing authorities. So I'm going to summarize some of their main points and say what we're doing to respond to these. Um, the first is that uh, the first point is we is that we must provide a transparent and easily interpretable information. That what we provide should not be confusing to agencies. That in addition to a comparison from the study period, which is a hybrid of 2013 and 14, we provide a comparison to the actual calendar year 2014 fees and when they're available, the actual calendar year 2015 fees. And uh, that we provide a way to be able to show um, the different comparisons than just the actual to what this study says is full cost fees. There were some suggestions on other ways to compare these data. There are two main ways that, that were suggested. One was to allow for the ability to compare different prorations of the existing formula to what this study says are the full cost for agencies. The other method that, they, that was suggested is, is that we compare the actual uh, 2014 amounts to what this cost formula might be if the, pro if the appropriations were not sufficient to cover the full costs. So to that end, um, we think these are useful comments. And so we are going to provide a chart that has the calendar year 2014 actuals. And on that chart, it will show a comparison against the estimated full cost from this study. The chart will also have the ability to uh, put in a proration amount of whatever proration amount you might choose. So the current proration is around 75%. If you wanted to see what the comparison is at a higher proration, say 95% of the current formula against what the full cost is, you could enter that information and it will produce at the PHA level and nationally at the total appropriations level what that comparison would be. It will also be able to compare the amount of, if you were to compare the actual, your actual 2014s against a, an amount that might not be the fully funded of this formula. So if this formula, if Congress and uh, if the amount appropriated was uh, less than 100% of the full cost, as this study shows, um, you could put in, say, 95%, and you could see how that would impact individual PHAs. Um, this is, uh, from, from HUD's perspective, uh, I think we think this last, this last comparison is probably a very useful comparison. None of us actually know what the, uh, what the appropriation is going to be. The study clearly states what the appropriation needs to be to fully fund an effective and efficient agency. Um, 
but this uh, tool will allow you to be able to see if that does not happen, how this formula would play out uh, in comparison. So that's my digression. I hope that was useful. Um, so following this meeting, uh, we're going to uh, issue, we're, we're, we're in the process of developing a notice of information for publication in the Federal Register. So this notice for information will ask a lot of, will ask for feedback on the formula, on the, on the full cost formula. It will ask for feedback on the study and um, it to sort of inform the process as we move towards doing rulemaking here. With that, I will turn this over to Milan Austin, or to Danielle Bastere. Thanks, Todd. Happy Friday, everyone. So what's next? Um, during the course of summer and early fall of 2015, HUD will hold a number of convening sessions around the country to discuss the study with individual PHAs and other interested stakeholders. And the main purpose of these sessions will be to both explain the findings of the study and also to inform the development of the proposed rule. We want to seek feedback on the study and the study findings and get comments on the development of the admin fee formula. And we want to focus specifically on some of the issues that you heard today, as well as things like how should we phase in gainers and decliners? Um, what do you think about how the study handles portability, the recommended formula for portability? Um, the study's cost drivers themselves and how we can best address any volatility within those cost drivers and whether there should be minimum fees, floor fees, as Jennifer discussed, and if so, how they should be established. We're also planning on developing FAQs, webinars, PowerPoints, and other materials um, to fully explain the findings of the study, the recommended new formula, and the benefits of moving to a new formula. As both Lourdes and Kathy said, we do believe that outreach to PHAs and other stakeholders is critical during this process. We want to be as transparent as possible with our partners. And finally, we would seek to publish the admin fee formula proposed rule in the late autumn, early winter of calendar year 2015. And with that, I'll turn it over to Marina to take some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Danielle and Todd, for talking to us about the study rollout and implementation. Um, now we're going to turn to the question and answer periods. We're going to turn to the audience, both here at HUD headquarters and those of you who are joining us online. Um, we'll be taking questions at the microphone here and via email. Um, you should see the email address on the bottom of your screen. It is HCV Admin Fee Study Public Briefing, all one word. I know it's long, but it says what we are. Um, HCV Admin Fee Study Public Briefing at HUD.gov. Um, so with that, I don't know if there are any questions in the audience. If not, um, I will turn to uh, Mike Dennis, who's going to read the questions we've gotten online. Uh, we do have a, a couple of questions uh, so far, Marina. The first question we've received uh, states the following. Will you please tell us where to find the indexes that will be used as the wage index and the health insurance cost index? It's a great question. Um, sure. So I can take that question. Um, I think the best place to look would be in the draft final report that's on the website that, that uh, Todd mentioned. Um, in there, there is a description of all of the variables and the sources that we uh, used where we pulled the data from. So the wage index is based on um, data obtained from the Bureau of Labor Statistics quarterly census of employment and wages. Again, in the report, there's a website and some more materials. And the health uh, cost index is based on the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Um, I'm going to forget. It's the MEPS. I don't know what that stands for, but it's a survey of um, health insurance costs. And again, so I think the best place is to look in the report itself, in the weeds, in chapter 6 and 7, um, to find those references. Yes, and we can definitely add those to the FAQs that we put online as well. Another question, please? Uh, sure. Our next question uh, reads as follows. Realizing that 92% of HAs will benefit from the increase to the administrative fees, will large housing authorities be adversely affected by the study and why? 
Okay. Um, Todd, do you want to handle that? Uh, well, I think in Jennifer's presentation, she noted the uh, number of agencies that would be affected by size. And for all size categories, most agencies would have an increase in funding at the full cost uh, to administer. There are some, so the, the smallest agencies have, almost all of them would have an increase, but well over, in fact, I don't think I have the chart here, but. Uh, for most most other agencies, it's well over 80%, as I recall, um, for size. So there are some mid-size and large agencies that would not uh, gain from this, as uh, Jennifer noted, and that's largely due to having significantly higher fair market rents than their local wage rate. That's and know, perhaps some of the other characteristics of the uh, uh, of of who they serve. Another question from online? Uh, did the researchers identify any ways that PHAs or HUD could reduce the costs or cost burden of administering the program? Hmm. Jennifer, would you like to take that? Sure. So we, um, that wasn't part of our mandate to identify um, ways to reduce costs. However, what, what we've done in the full report, which I think will be very helpful, is we've come up with estimates for the time for each of the different activities um, required for the program and also a cost associated with that. So if there were, um, you know, so, so rec as there are on the table recommendations for reducing uh, aspects of the program or changing aspects of the program to reduce costs, we can use the results of the study to calculate, to estimate what that, that cost reduction would be associated with that. Does the new fee calculation encourage adoption of the small area FMR rent approach? Todd, would you like to take that? No, this, that's not what this study does. What this study does is it, it does uh, recognize that agencies that have uh, tenants that are uh, locating units in areas with relatively high rents compared to their far fair market rent in their metropolitan area, that it is in fact more costly for them to do that. And so the formula recognized that, but this formula, but this is not a uh, saying that, that we're moving to small area fair market rents uh, as part of this formula. Another online question? Uh, the next question is, where does the $65 uh, value for small area rent ratio come from? It seems like a high amount compared to, say, new admissions. Jennifer, that's for you. <laughs> <clears throat> so that comes out of the regression modeling that we did for the study. So what the regression model does is it takes, it, it tries to understand how to explain the variation in per unit costs that we see across the agencies and it basically assigns a weight to each of the variables that we've tested. So this is the a lower coefficient assign or a lower weight assigned to a given variable suggests that it has less uh, had less to do with explaining the variation um, that we observe and um, so it, it comes straight out of uh, straight out of the regression model. Again, I think for, for the details on that, the best place to look is in um, chapters six and seven of the draft final report. Great, okay, thank you. We have a question here, if you could just say, state your name and then your question, please. Hi, my name, uh, is this on? I hope so. Yes. Okay, Hi. my name is Eva Wingren, I'm with the Young Leaders in Affordable Housing. Um, I wanna thank you for, um, sort of alluding to some of the um, drivers of um, better resident outcomes. Um, I know that that probably wasn't part of the mandate of the study, but including um, you know, the higher costs for leasing in higher rent areas, I think will um, help, um, Sorry, will we'll help uh, manage some of the disincentives um, that might have been taking place. Uh, my question is, on page 14 and 15, you have um, 
estimates of the total cost of measuring the, uh, administering the whole Housing Choice Voucher Program um, under the new formula as being $1.835 billion, and then um, the old formula with no proration, so 100%, as being uh, 1.923 billion, and I was just wondering um, why the decision was made to focus on the amounts under the current proration and not comparing. Here's the cost. Here's the the cost to administer the program under old formula. Here's the cost to administer the program under new formula, and the new formula seems to be more efficient because it's less costly. So if I uh, understand the question correctly, I think the, the, this is actually the point I w th that I made in a very long-winded way in my previous comment. But the, the, the study itself is saying, what is the cost? The full, it, we want to demonstrate first is what is the full cost of operating this program against what you're actually getting paid now. And that's what the study did, and that's what the study shows is a change. Um, the existing formula has not been funded at 100% or even close to 100% of uh, proration for some time. Um, but nonetheless, we understand a lot of people want to do a comparison against what the old formula is and this pr the full cost of this formula. So we're going to provide a tool that allows folks to do that to test different proration rates, if I think I understand the question right. So we're going to actually provide a, a spreadsheet. This is really just a, it's a, just a spreadsheet where you can input the proration amount that you want to put in there from the current formula against this full funding formula to see what the difference would be. And it's also going to be able to show the difference between what uh, this, uh, what you're actually receiving today versus um, what a not 100% full funding of this formula. So it gives you the flexibility to look at that in many different ways. So we're going to provide that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, hi. Hi, I'm Jade Craig from the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity here at HUD. Um, thanks so much for uh, offering this briefing about the study. Um, my question is, how does the fee formula incentivize portability or make it easier for PHAs to connect voucher holders to high opportunity neighborhoods? Uh, and if the, uh, the new administrative free formula would have any impact on increasing portability at all? Jennifer, you want to? So one thing that the new fee formula does is it removes the burden of billing for the administrative fee between agencies. So they're no longer, they will still continue to bill for HAP, but no longer be billing for the administrative fee. So we think that that uh, reduces some of the burden associated with portability currently. Um, the small area rent ratio variable also captures some of the outcomes associated with an agency able to help families to move into opportunity neighborhoods. So to the extent that agencies are able to do that and they, they spend resources to do that, the formula will compensate them for that. So those are kind of the two ways. Um, how, you know, how portability will be affected in the future isn't something that we have modeled out as part of the study. Okay, thank you. I'm Tamar Greenspan. I'm with the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials. Jennifer, in your presentation, you mentioned that the new eligibility is about 95% of the eligibility under the existing formula. I'm wondering if you guys can comment on whether the department is planning to adjust its 2016 uh, appropriations request, which currently is only for a 90% proration, to adjust it to actually cover those full costs. Um. Why do I always get the hard questions? Um, so, I mean, the, the budget process, the way it works, is you know, we, we um, uh, have produced the president's budget. It's what's being debated right now. In fact, we met with the appropriators yesterday. Um, so the, the budget number is the budget number. What will happen going forward in 16 uh, will depend on um, both the appropriators and our conversations with them. What I can say is that we met with both the appropriators and the authorizers already. So they're anxious to see the full study, and, and, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, as Loris had mentioned, it was, a, it was really a very good meeting. 
They've been asking for the department to do this. Um, we've done it uh, quite competently, and hopefully that will help inform their decisions as they make, as they go to conference and make a decision about the 16 number, hopefully sometime this fall. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kate Covey, and I work in HUD's Office of Fair Housing. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about, so this study was about what administrative fees are needed for a, to have a high-performing housing choice voucher program. And if you could talk a little bit to me about what indicates high performance, is it purely quantitative in um, voucher utilization, or is there some qualitative measures kind of getting to Jade's point about voucher use in high opportunity areas? So if you could just talk a little bit more about that. So there was, to identify these sites, we had a, a multi-part process. And the first thing is having the, all of the sites had a track record of high performance on CMAP. So that would consider things like the utilization is weighed quite highly in CMAP as well as other indicators. And I know that the expanding housing opportunities is a bonus, but they would, they have to have a high a track record of high performance. Then after that, we went out and did a site visit and we have 14 um, high performance criteria that we developed through the study team. And this was also one of the things that we got a lot of feedback from on the expert and industry uh, technical review group. And the PHAs that were selected for the study had to score well on, the, on those 14 indicators in total. Uh, one of those indicators, I believe, and I can remember, remind myself, they're in the report, has to do with expanding housing opportunities. Um, but that was not a, that in itself was not a screening factor. So if a PHA did very well on the other um, criteria, um, and, 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 and what we found on that particular variable is that the PHAs in the study, actually most of them really prioritize expanding housing opportunities, but at the time that we conducted the study it, with the budget constraints, it they did not end up being a high percentage of the time that they spent on the program, but it was important to them. So. Uh, the site visits resulted in the, this ranking against the, the, the 14, or the, the rating against the 14 criteria, and then there was also a qualitative component in that the site visits were done by people with expertise in the program who came up with narrative comments about, about the, uh, the programs themselves. So it's kind of a hybrid of, of quantitative and qualitative. So I have the 14 criteria, um, oh. if uh, that would help. Um, the PHA maintains an accurate and complete and up-to-date wait, waiting list. The PHA has effective processes for managing portability. The PHA conducts HQS inspections in a timely manner, provides adequate notification to owners, and takes appropriate action for failed or late inspections. The PHA processes uh, RAFTAs, uh, request for tenant assistance um, within reasonable time frames. The PHA makes efforts to expand housing opportunities for HCV tenants. Um, the PHA follows a strong rent reasonableness policy. The PHA correctly calculates the total tenant payment, family share, and HAP, housing assistance payment. The PHA monitors utilization and success rates. The PHA demonstrates sound financial management practices. The PHA has effective communication with tenants and landlords. PHA provides tenant uh, training, excuse me, for staff and management. Tenant files, whether paper or electronic, are well organized and contain adequate documentation. The PHA has an informed HCV program director, and the PHA has rigorous program monitoring, reporting, and quality control protocols. A fairly exhaustive list. <laughs> Any questions online? I guess we do. Uh, can you provide a little more detail on one of the components listed, percent of households with earned income? I do not quite understand what that has to do with admin fee costs. Sure. So one of the things we found in the study, so we, we did a couple of different analyses. Um, on the, in the time, we looked at the time for select activities by household type. And the thing we focused on was the time for an annual recertification by household type. Because annual recertifications are a large share of the overall time that agencies spend on, on administering the program. The household types that we had is not, 
households with earnings wasn't a household type per se, but we, had, we looked at family households, large and small families, elderly households, non-elderly, disabled households, and homeless households. And we found that PHA spent more time um, conducting annual recertifications for family households um, than, than for the other household types, and for, than for, particularly for elderly and non-elderly disabled. So we have that piece of information. We know that uh, family size or family to being a family household is highly correlated with being a household with earnings. So households that are families are much more likely to be households with earnings. We also then did, in our cost driver analysis, we used a broader range of data than was just available through the time study. So we could actually look at whether the percent of households with earnings was a cost driver, was associated with higher costs. And we found that actually the serving ho family households and serving households with wages were both uh, correlated with, or with higher, co higher program costs. And we can see that in the time data um, through the annual recertification analysis. Households with earnings was a much stronger variable, was a stronger variable, uh, stronger cost driver identified through our regression analysis than, than, than the family uh, elderly distinction. So we, and, and it makes sense because it, it has to do with um, the, the, the income recertification that goes on is more complex for a family with earnings than for a family on, on fixed income. So it, 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 was a, it was a variable that showed up as a, as in the regression analysis as being important and is also backed up by our time um, study findings. Another question? If the basis of the new formula is still unit months leased at the first of the month, how would the new formula address intake and lease up work associated with participants who don't actually lease up? So there's a couple, um, we've wrestled with this question throughout the study, there's a couple of ways in which it does. First of all, it's important to recognize that the cost per voucher that is the basis for the whole formula includes for, it, we call it, it's a ca cost per voucher under lease, but for every voucher under lease, there's a lot of work that goes on for a household that does not lease up. And that all those costs are embedded in the cost per voucher under lease. So when we say cost per voucher under lease, it's not just the cost associated with that particular family under lease. It's that family and all the other families that didn't um, lease up. So that's one thing. So it's in there. It's in the overall base cost for the formula. The second thing is that the formula itself recognizes that there are additional costs associated with intake. Because um, we found that in the time study. We know that it takes a lot of time. So to the extent that a, 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 that a PHA has more intake than another PHA, either because of through turnover in their program or for like, getting new allocations, they would be compensated for that through the formula with more fee. Okay. Does HUD have any plans to use updated information from PIC annually in calculating the administrative fee each funding year, or will an adjustment factor be applied? <laughs> um, so what we've recommended in the study is that each of these um, variables be updated annually based on the latest available data. So depending on when in the cycle it happens, it might be a full year of data or the last 12 months of data, whenever that falls. So there are, um, so the idea is this, yes, it would be updated each year based on the most recent to reflect the PHA's cost drivers for each individual PHA. There are three variables in the formula that are quite volatile from year to year. Um, the uh, health index, the health cost index, the uh, households with earnings, and the new admissions rate. So those can really go up and down um, in a, over time. We analyze the last five years of data for a given PHA. So if left unrestrained and just updating those each year, your PHA could experience some, some fairly big swings in their fee, which I think would be hard to manage administratively. PHAs need predictability to some extent, as far as is possible, to plan their programs. So what we've recommended for those three variables is using a three-year average. So that average would still get updated every year. So you know, in 2013, the average was from 11, 12, and 13. And in 14, it would be updated to be from 12, 13, and 14. But it substantially reduces the volatility that you see to use a three-year average. 
Um, so we've just suggested it for those three variables. The other variables in the study, based on our analysis of the last five years, don't change all that much. But they would, everything would be updated each year. In addition, so what happens is you update all the formula inputs, but the base costs that the formula is based on were base costs from 2013. So we need to make sure that when the formula spits out a cost at the end of, at the, end of the process, we need to update that for inflation. And I mentioned that we, we've recommended a blended inflation factor that takes into account um, non-labor cost labor and benefits inflation. So that would also be an update each year. How did the study take the impact of sequestration on PHA operations into account during the time measurement period in determining the cost of administering the program? If a PHA had to lay off staff during that period, wouldn't their true administrative costs not be recognized by the time measurement period? So that's a great question, and this is also something that um, when we kind of saw what the timing was of our study and we got into it that we really had to think very carefully about. What we did is we identified for each housing authority in the study whether they had made cuts um, between the time that we came out and visited them and you know, confirmed that they were high performing and then the time later on where we came out and did the time measurement. So that time span, we, we figured out what cuts they might have made in response to, to budget um, pressures. And I should just say that the time period ranged from probably six, less than six months for some sites to up to two years um, between when we visited them and when we came out and did the data collection. And I think for most sites it was around a year or just under a year. So we talked to the agencies um, in detail about what they had done in that interim period and whether they had um, laid off staff or um, reduced staff hours or shifted staff to other programs or changed their processes or did other things. And we had a pretty um, generous standard in the sense that we, we wanted to make sure, because we didn't know what the effect of all these cuts were, we, we, we tried to determine whether the cut was one that either the housing authority thought had um, affected their ability to be a high performing and efficient program or they thought had a, had a chance, you know, would, would potentially affect their ability to be a high performing um, and efficient program. And it was important to do that because there were certain changes that PHAs made that they said saved the money but they would have done anyway. An example is setting up a kind of a, like a web based landlord portal one of the PHAs in the study did that. They said they'd wanted to do that all along. It saved them money. It had nothing to do with sequestration. So we wanted to make sure we weren't, um, yeah, that we treated those kinds of cost cuts separately. Then what we did for, for every cut that was identified that could potentially affect um, the high performance, we, we worked with the PHA to put a number around that. So in some cases, if staff were laid off, it was easy. We had their last year's salary. We knew what they would have been paid. Um, and then, you know, in other cases, it was a little more complicated. And then we added the value of those cost cuts back to our cost estimates at the end of the day. So those people are no longer there at the agency. They are not responding to their phones. They are not in the time data, but they are in the cost data. Um, and so there's, there's a, a fairly detailed discussion of this in the report as well. Um, about how we, dis how we sort of treated different types of cuts. But our basic approach was to identify what had been done, to quantify it, and then to add it to our um, cost estimate. Uh, we, we have a number of questions that sort of touch on the, the same issue, which really has to do with the timing of when HUD expects that the new for fee formula would be implemented. Would it be FY 2016, FY 2017? Uh, how long will it take HUD and Congress to adopt and approve the recommended changes in the study? Daniel, would you? Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so as I said earlier, um, we are looking to publish the proposed rule in the late autumn, early winter of calendar, calendar year 2015. Um, the goal would be to publish the final rule before the end of fiscal year 16, um, so that the new fee methodology would become effective for CY 17. Um, that is our current proposed time frame. Thank you, Daniel. Does the 60-mile cost driver also consider that a PHA with a 20-mile jurisdiction in a congested urban area 
may be just as costly as the PHA that operates in a 60-mile rural jurisdiction. Well, we thought about that a fair amount, and we collected data through uh, Google Analytics and other things on drive time. So we did test, as in addition to understanding the overall area, well, we looked at lots of measures of distance. One of them was sort of the overall area of the housing authority's jurisdiction. Another was uh, the median distance of a, of a voucher holder to the headquarters. We looked at the 60 mile variable and we looked at a drive time variable. So what is the average drive time that a housing authority, um, what is the average drive time, I guess, the, the, what does the average distance translate to to, in drive time for a given housing authority, recognizing right that uh, two miles in Los Angeles is different from two miles somewhere else. Um, we did not find that the drive time variable was a significant cost driver, um, then, whereas the 60 mile variable um, was. And you know, we hypothesized it could, it could have to do with, with setting up satellite offices and the, having the physical presence um, in, the, in, the, in the farther flung areas. So we tested it, but we didn't find anything there. The next question reads, what percentage of the fee is overhead, um, management staff, et cetera? I got, the I got the question, and I'm not recalling exactly what the overhead percentage of costs are. Um, why don't we, can we go on to the next question yeah. and we'll find it? It's in chapter five, yeah. Todd. Yeah. I can. <laughs> Um, the next question we have is, is it your assessment that the proposed formula would support poverty deconcentration efforts or not? Well, the formula does support the uh, finding that uh, it is harder to lease up in higher rent areas of a metro area. And so the formula does take that into account. And to the extent that uh, that factor leads to uh, more folks uh, trying to lease folks up into higher rent areas that might have an effect, but we don't know. Obviously, it's something we could study as time goes by. Yeah. Okay, Jennifer, do you have any? Okay, yes. So overall, on average, across the 60 PHAs, overhead cost represented 19% of the cost per voucher. So uh, that overhead is in the cost per voucher that goes into the formula, and it was approximately on average 19%. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Todd, thank you for addressing the letter and the issue that uh, Clafa, Naro, and Fada wrote. I appreciate that. Can you introduce yourself, please? Oh, sorry, Jonathan Zimmerman with the Public Housing Authorities Directors Association. Um, my question is to you, uh, Todd, earlier in the, from a caller, Housing Authority asked a question about small area rent ratio, and you answered the question that was asked. However, I'd like to drill down a little further with you. So one sentence in the executive summary referring to small area rent ratio says, for PHAs in metropolitan counties, the small area rent ratio is the cal calculated as the median gross rent. That's what I want to focus on for my question, median gross rent. For zip codes, where voucher holders live, weighted by the share of voucher holders in each zip code, divided by the median gross rent for the metropolitan area. So my question is, when you're referring to median gross rent there, is that the FMR for that zip code and the median for the uh, overall area? Or is that the gross rent that came into the voucher program for voucher participants living in that area? I'm going to use my phone a friend here. Okay, Jennifer. Uh, no, actually, well, Jennifer, I don't know if you, you know that one. I was going to call up, uh, see if Peter, or Peter Kahn wanted to come answer that question since he does, develops those. And while he's and, coming up to answer that, um, you know, it's my assumption without even hearing the answer that to the earlier caller's question, there is an overlay for metropolitan counties between zip code, median gross rents, AKA small area FMRs, and then you obviously look at where people live and what those median gross rents are for that locality compared to the area overall. So it's not that small area FMRs were not used at all for that ratio, for that variable. No, no, that, that was, I'm sorry if that's what your takeaway was from that, that's not what I intended. But um, I don't know if, who wants to, Jennifer or Peter, either of you want to take this? 
Peter, can you take, take the calculation question? Thanks. This is Peter Kahn, who's director of our Economic Market and Analysis Division. Thanks, Todd. Uh, so if I understand the correct question correctly, Jonathan, uh, the, the numerator of the calculation is, is the median gross rent across all bedroom sizes for the uh, zip code divided by the median gross rent for the entire Neither. So it is part of the FMR calculation, uh, or excuse me, it's part of the small area FMR calculation. Um, and then that ratio is weighted by where the tenants actually are located. Okay, I think um, we can have our, our last question now. Uh, last question. Would the proposed formula begin with a minimum fee with add-ons for cost drivers? The study actually starts out with a minus number for statistical reasons, which is a bit concerning. So that, that's an, an artifact of the regression model, as it starts out with a minus number, but it's not possible for any agency to have a, a negative fee. Um, that is just the way that the formula, what, that's what's needed in order to determine the coefficients for the other variables. Um, we did, as we discussed, we would recommend a floor fee um, of, of, of $42 for, for PHAs outside the territories and 54 for PHAs in the territories, and that's in the event that PHAs have a low combination of variables and resulting in a low fee it would never be negative. It would just be somewhat below 42. Um, but since we did not observe uh, any PHA in our study operating a high performing efficient program for less than 42, we would recommend that as a floor. Unless, Todd, do you have anything to add to that? Or? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. This concludes the um, Housing Choice Voucher Administrative Fee Study uh, public briefing. We want to thank, again, all of the PHAs who participated in the study. This would not be possible without them. Um, and all of the expert and industry technical review group members um, for their hard work and thoughtful comments and uh, collaboration over the past few years on this effort. Um, we also want to thank Jennifer Turnham and the entire study team for their hard work um, and our panel today for their insightful contributions. Um, and uh, Mike for reading our questions online. Um, and we want to thank everybody who participated both in person and online and uh, we look forward to working with you as we roll out the study and begin the public comment process. Thank you so much. Thank you.